It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Tesher. Jennifer is the founder, president, and CEO of the Center for Financial Services Innovation, better known as CFSI. Since 2004, CFS, CFSI has, devoted, has been devoted to leveraging changes in technology to improve the quality of financial services for low and moderate income Americans. Over the past 12 years, CFSI has conducted the nation's first study on the unbanked and underbanked. They've championed financial capability as a more effective framework for driving consumer behavior change. They have invested more than $30 million in promising fintech innovations that improve the financial lives of everyday Americans and they have increased the understanding of underserved consumers and the market opportunities to serve them profitably and responsibly. Jennifer will kick off our conference by sharing her views on financial health and the implications for researchers and practitioners working in LMI communities. Please help me welcome Jennifer Tesher to the stage. so much. Good morning, everybody. So the last time I was in Kansas City for any extended period of time was when I was in college and I was an intern at the Kansas City Star. Uh, I looked it up last night because I couldn't quite remember which year it was. It was 1990, and I know this because I arrived about six weeks after the morning paper and the afternoon paper combined into one. Um, and I lived not too far from here. Um, this was empty land at the time. Um, I remember because uh, there used to be great concerts uh, out at the memorial. Um, and so I'm thrilled to be back and see what incredible development has taken place, obviously not just here, but in many other parts of the city. So thank you so much um, to the Fed for having me with you. Uh, I don't know about you, but this feels like a back to school moment for me. My kids just went back to school yesterday, and I uh, was just on vacation. This is like the first real work I've had to do. So if I'm a little bit rusty this morning, you will, um, I hope, forgive me. You know, we're going to be spending uh, the next two days talking about uh, the efforts that are going on on the ground that all of you are working on to help consumers, LMI consumers, uh, gain resiliency and mobility. Uh, but, so I don't want to start there, because that's where we're going to spend the next two days. I think it's always important to start these conversations uh, with an understanding of who's actually the consumer we're talking about. Um, and we all have our own anecdotes and stories from the work that we do, but I want to share one with you as a way to set the tone uh, for the rest of our time together. So I'm going to introduce you first to the Johnsons. The Johnsons live in Ohio in a small town uh, near Cincinnati. <clears throat> Sarah is 38 and Sam is 49, and this is the second marriage for both of them. Sarah works full-time as an HR assistant and part-time as a secretary. Sam sells electrical equipment and he coaches sports on the weekends and also works at a call center sometimes. They are supporting their daughter, Amy, who's eight, and two children from previous marriages, Matthew, who's 20, who's a full-time student who's living with them, and Anne, who's also 20, who's living with them part-time and is soon planning to move out. Now, if you look at their tax return for the year, things look pretty good. They've got multiple sources of income, and they're bringing in between fifty-five dollars and $60,000 a year, which is above the U.S. median. They have a house, they have two cars, they have 401k, they have health insurance, they spend money on clothes and on entertainment and on celebrating the important milestones in their families' lives. But if you look at their pay stubs, their pay stubs tell a different story. <clears throat> on a monthly basis, their income fluctuates dramatically from about $4,100 to $9,000 a month. Why? What's going on there? Well, Sam only received two-thirds of his pay for part of the year because he had foot surgery and had to go on disability. 
uh, their part-time jobs, Sam and Sarah's jobs, they pay irregularly. Sarah and her son are both getting college degrees, and they both get financial aid, but that aid arrives in lump sum checks a couple of times a year. Sarah's ex-husband is supposed to be providing child support, but that only arrives sporadically. Now, Sarah manages the money, and she is really paying attention. She's got a straightforward system. Each paycheck that they get goes to a particular bill. One goes to the mortgage. They owe just over $70,000 on a house that they estimate is worth $92,000. Another paycheck goes to their car payments, and whatever is left over is meant to cover everything else. She pays the majority of her bills online and just in time so that she can make sure that there's money there to cover them. But the system isn't foolproof, and you know the timing of their income receipt never seems to line up well with when the expenses hit, when the bills are due. And there have been a couple of times where the cell phone's been cut off or their lights have been cut off. To make matters even more complicated, their expenses seem to be as volatile as their income. Over a seven-month period, their monthly expenses varied from about $4,600 all the way up to $11,000. So what happened during that $11,000 month? Well, they both uh, live in a suburban area uh, that doesn't have any public transportation, and they really need good transportation to get to all those jobs I mentioned. And their car, one of their cars was, was acting up, being unreliable, and so they bought a new one. Um, but just as that happened, just as they bought the new car, they ended up having a leaky roof. And that caused water damage. The water damage exacerbated one of their children's asthma. That caused a trip to the hospital. They had to replace the furniture. They had to buy an air purifier. You get the picture. The Johnsons have also had a broader range of health issues. So Sarah had to have a CT scan and then had her appendix removed. Sam had that foot surgery that I mentioned. Their daughter, Anne, had to go undergo a medical procedure. Uh, Matthew's got a chronic illness. The list goes on. And while they have employer-sponsored health insurance, they nonetheless owe about $8,300 for unpaid medical bills and other medical debt. Given all of the challenges that they're facing financially, the Johnsons owe about $3,000 across seven different credit cards. If you ask them what their greatest financial aspiration is, they'll say, we just want to be able to pay our bills on time. Now, the Johnsons are clearly hardworking, but something's not working for them. We sometimes think that it's all about how much money you have, uh, but that's clearly not it. They have plenty of access to financial products. Some would say they're overbanked. Um, and they're quite aware of their financial situation. They have a system. It's just not working for them all the time. Now, the Johnsons, of course, aren't their real name, but they are absolutely a real family. We've just changed some of the details um, to maintain their privacy. They're one of the families that uh, we followed as part of the US Financial Diaries research project. Uh, we uh, have been working on this project in partnership with New York University um, for quite some time now. And the gist of it was that we followed about 200 families in four different communities around the country for a year. We had field workers who visited them every couple of weeks to document every dime that moved in and out of those, house, those households um, and to understand the choices that people were making um, and the broader circumstances that can get lost in an annual um, Federal Reserve survey. That data is really valuable, but there's really no substitute for getting in and understanding deeply people's lives day to day. And uh, we found incredible stories just like the Johnsons, lots of different families um, in these four different parts of the country, all with some different version of, of a similar story. We suspected that the things we were seeing uh, in the financial diaries wasn't isolated. And so we decided to conduct a national survey a couple of years ago to take a snapshot of the state of financial health in America. And these are some of the things that we found. We found that 30% of Americans 
could last only three months or less if they had a sudden loss of income. 27% of Americans have saved less than $1,000 for retirement. That's probably, for me, the most scary number up there. And 43% said that they struggled to pay their bills and make their debt payments on time. In fact, we found that 53%, I mean, 57% of Americans are not healthy, not financially healthy. It's more than twice the number of people that the FDIC says are on un or underbanked. They lack the day-to-day -day systems that enable them to build resilience and pursue opportunity, which is what this conference is about over the next couple of days. Now, there's been, um, since, since our study, a raft of new data. The Federal Reserve has a new uh, study called the SHED survey that looks at household economic decision making. Pew Charitable Trust also has been looking at uh, similar trends and has terrific data. Uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute has been looking at data from their vast trove of customer data and has been documenting similar trends and all show the same thing, that while many families appear to have the trappings of success, jobs, homes, health insurance, mm -hmm. retirement accounts, a closer look reveals an unsettling level of financial fragility, stress, and reduced confidence about the future. It used to be that we didn't think about um, stability and mobility as trade-offs. We thought about one leading to the other. Um, and that you would, you know, uh, cl climb the proverbial um, ladder. Uh, but in, uh, in some Pew research uh, that I often cite because I'm so taken with it, people were asked this question, if you had to choose between climbing the ladder, you know, making some more income, or having some stability, which would you choose? And the overwhelming majority of Americans uh, choose stability. I think it's because people are incredibly worried and concerned about their financial futures. So I'm going to document now a few of the key trends that we've seen coming out of this data that I just described to you. There's three, I think, important takeaways. Um, one is around cash flow. Uh, one is around the kinds of behaviors that seem to make a difference. And um, the third is about um, uh, having access to financial services, um, and, but yet that not being sufficient. So as you heard me talk about in the diaries, we documented people's income and their cash flow because we were able to see it so frequently. And really the, the important realization for us was that people don't live year to year. We tend to think about median income over the course of a year. Uh, but they don't live that way. People live month to month. They live week to week. Uh, and people who might look even on an annual basis, their inflows and their outflows match up, um, look anything but on a monthly or a weekly basis. And that's where people get into trouble. American household incomes overall became 30% more volatile in the early 1970s, uh, between the 70s and the late 2000s. Um, and income spikes and dips were very common for families in the U.S. financial diaries. So as this slide shows, uh, on average, uh, they had 2.7 spikes and dips in their income in the course of a year. And we defined a spike or a dip as being 25% above or below the norm. So not just a little bump, a very significant uh, spike. So that's essentially five months out of the year where your income is either higher or lower than the norm. Now where this gets even more complicated is that people also have volatile expenses. We tend to think in financial planning terms that most of people's expenses are fixed and then there are some expenses on the top that are variable. But um, we found that people's, uh, people had fewer fixed expenses than you would have expected and more uh, variability in, in their expenses. And the problem occurs when the spikes in income don't match up with the spikes in expense, which happens um, at least several times a year. And when you don't have 
um, any slack, either access to savings or access to credit, um, you end up with really no release valve. Um, and you end up creating a very stressful situation. Second key takeaway is around um, in the role of income. So when we did our financial health survey a couple of years ago, we segmented uh, the people that we surveyed um, into seven categories, and then we grouped those categories according to um, their overall health status. And we wanted to understand what factors led to better financial health. What was driving uh, uh, these groupings? And you know, your first, your first inclination is to think about income. But income really didn't tell the whole story. Um, think about it this way. One third of uh, the coping and vulnerable uh, uh, households make more than $60,000 a year. And similarly, a third of the healthy households make less than $60,000 a year. In fact, um, just to put a finer point on it, one third of the households that make over $100,000 were in a coping or vulnerable segment. So income matters. Absolutely, income matters, but it is not the only thing that matters. And in fact, um, uh, there are other things that make more of a positive impact on being able to be financially healthy. What are those things? Um, they're planning and saving. So uh, households that plan for large, irregular expenses are 10 times more likely to be financially healthy as those that don't. And households that have a regular savings habit, um, the key there is regular and habit, um, are four times more likely to be financially healthy. Income had maybe a 2x, um, a 1.2 or 2x effect. So income matters, um, but it is not the only thing that matters. And although households with higher incomes were certainly more likely to be financially healthy, Planning is much more predictive of financial health than income. The third key takeaway is around access to financial services. You know, when CFSI started its life 12 years ago, um, we were primarily focused on access. People like to think of us as the un and underbanked people. Um, and we spent a lot of time talking about the importance of having an on ramp to financial services in order to uh, be able to um, be upwardly mobile. But I think what we've realized and what the data shows us is that access, while really important, is wholly insufficient. Um, because in our survey, 90% of consumers have checking accounts. But 54% of them are struggling financially, and 6% of them are still cashing checks at, at uh, stores other than banks. 31% uh, describe themselves as living paycheck to paycheck. Think about it this way, 74% of uh, the survey respondents have a savings account, but more than half of them have no planned savings habit, and four in 10 aren't confident about their short-term savings goals. Here's another one. 88% of consumers use direct deposit, but one-third are still juggling bill payments, at least some of the time. So all of this data that I've shared with you, taken together, presents what I like to think of as a revised diagnosis of the financial pressure that families face. And it suggests that policymakers and practitioners alike really need to redefine what financial success means in order to better align the ways in which we try to advance financial success with consumers' actual expectations and goals. And so that leads us to financial health. CFSI has been on a financial health journey now for only a couple of years. And it was so heartening to hear uh, the remarks this morning uh, really being framed around financial health and so much of the agenda being framed that way. Um, we've spent the last couple of years trying to define what financial health means. Um, this is our definition here. And to work towards a common framework and a set of indicators and metrics for measuring financial health. The CFPB has, doing, has been doing much of the same. 
Um, and while we've been working in parallel, our work is highly complementary. Uh, and I've been really just amazed at how quickly this thinking has taken off. Um, and I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about why I think that is and what we need to do next. So financial health is having the day-to-day -day systems that enable you to avoid the bad things, avoid the nightmares, and strive for the positive things in, in life. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, but it's that day-to-day -day system that I want to unpack for a second. Because the day-to-day -day system is actually made up of two things. It's the access that people have to institutions and products. It's structural. Um, it's the way society operates and the rules and laws that we have. Um, and then the other part of the system are the choices and behaviors and decisions that people make every day. And it's absolutely both of those things that we need. Access alone is insufficient, but so is financial capability work, financial education work, uh, efforts to try to make behavior change for people. Um, it's got to be both of those things uh, together. Um, and so the agenda today and tomorrow, I think, really reflects that idea that it's about both of those ideas combined. But how do we know what it looks like when we see it? That's what we've been working towards for the last couple of years. Um, after we did this survey, we identified a list of 22 indicators of financial health. And based on the data and results, we narrowed that down and winnowed it down and narrowed it down some more. And earlier this year, we came out with a set of eight financial health indicators. Um, and they're pretty basic when you think about it. Spend less than you bring in. Pay your bills on time and in full. Have sufficient liquid savings. Have sufficient long-term savings and assets. Have a sustainable debt load. Have a prime credit score. Have appropriate insurance. And plan ahead for expenses. Rules to live by, right? If only it were that easy. Uh, and for each of those, we've defined what it looks like if you're um, doing it well, what it looks like if you're maybe got a little work to do, and what it looks like if you're in the danger zone. And earlier this year, we recruited seven financial services providers of varying kinds, a couple of banks, a credit union, a large prepaid provider, um, some fintech companies, um, and they have agreed to start pulling the data they have from their customer files to try to start the effort of measuring the financial health of their own customers. Because the case that we've been trying to make, particularly the financial services industry, is that um, you're not in the banking business you're really in the financial health business. That's, that's what your customers want from you. That's the value you bring. That's how you differentiate yourself from your competitors. Um, because you don't really, but you don't really manage what isn't measured. And so our idea is if we can get more financial services providers measuring the financial health of their customers and being able to see the difference uh, that their products and their advice and their services make, um, that then uh, those companies are going to take that advice to heart. So we're really excited to see what we learn from what these companies are doing um, and the data that they're gathering. And I think it will help us to continue to refine uh, these indicators um, and ideally to simplify them even further. We're also working on developing a financial health score. Right now, that score is really to help providers make sense of the data. But you could imagine a day in which there were, would be a score available to the consumer. So the consumers can measure, can measure and take control of their own financial health, similar to a credit score. There are already some, in, some companies out in the marketplace that are experimenting with this. Um, and we're really excited about the potential of that. 
So once we've got a common framework and a set of indicators and metrics that we feel good about as it relates to financial health, um, what else? What do we do next? The reason why I really like the financial health framework and why I'm so excited about this event is because um, I've heard that in the past, these events tended to go deep into one particular solution set or another. But I think what financial health tells us is that there is no one solution. We need everybody playing their role um, uh, to help people uh, get on their way. And so I think the other thing that's really important to recognize is that financial health is bigger than financial services. It's not just a financial services problem. It's a healthcare problem. It's a higher ed problem. It's a workforce problem. It's a global problem. We've actually been doing some work with the Gates Foundation to do some research in India and Kenya to understand whether and how the financial health framework that I just described um, could apply in a developing country context. Wouldn't it be amazing if we had the same framework globally and we could be having a global dialogue about these issues? Uh, similarly, we're starting to work with some employers uh, because your, employer, your employees are going to be far more productive um, and likely to stick around um, if you're um, removing some of the financial stresses from their lives. Uh, similarly, I'm excited about the panel on healthcare and the connections between physical and financial health because I think they are, um, there's a lot we can be learning from each other. Um, so I think that uh, I'm excited about this audience and we at CFSI are trying to bring even broader audiences together. I think we need to broaden the tent um, because the more people we can bring in who are thinking about this and working on this set of issues from different uh, positions, I think is going to make our work and our efforts more successful. And then finally, particularly given that we're in an election year, uh, I think it's really important that we talk about making financial health a national priority. So imagine if we treated financial health like we treat public health. There's a cabinet level uh, position and a whole department uh, in Washington and the federal government. We have state and local public health departments. Uh, public health workers go out to restaurants and grade them based on a list of criteria. Um, what if we did the same thing for financial health? Uh, what if there were a set of tools and metrics by which grades were given to financial products? Uh, and what if uh, the next president decided that this was such an important national priority that there was a cabinet level position dedicated to financial health? What else would we do? What else could the government do to recognize the affirmative role that it has in promoting it. Regulation is incredibly important, and, and later today we're going to be talking about regulation as it relates to small dollar credit. Um, but regulation is the floor. It's like the minimum. Like, here's what you shouldn't do. Um, but what about what we could do? That's a very different kind of role for government, an affirmative role. Um, and uh, I think it's one that we really need to start advocating for uh, because our communities and our families um, need it and deserve it. Um, these problems and challenges that I documented here today, are, are, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You all are doing the important work on the ground. Uh, but I think what is still dawning on people is that this isn't just as a result of the financial crisis and the recession. These are structural challenges in our economy, um, and it's going to take us decades to work them through. Uh, and while we're working them through, what are we going to do in the meantime to help people get a stronger financial footing, to achieve that level of stability that allows them to then think about um, and aim for mobility? I'm really uh, glad to be here today to kick off this incredible event. Uh, and I'm going to stop now and take some questions. Thank you very much.
I understand that there are people who have microphones who are roving around, so if you have a question, just put up your hand. Here's one in the front. Good morning, it's Kelly Edmiston from the Kansas City Fed. Uh, one thing in uh, talking to um, people who do financial uh, financial education, who train people on finances, um, the program seem to focus a lot on the uh, um, cost side of the um, income statement. You know, the, and uh, there's this other part of an income, and would how can or if, should we be also focusing on the income side in terms of suggesting to people that maybe they seek out other forms of income? And um, what's your feeling about how that's being done now? Yeah. Um, I think it's sort of a both and, right? We, we, we got to find ways to bring in more money and reduce expenses to the degree that you can. I think in a lot of cases, though, it's not about reducing expenses. It's about managing the timing of your money, managing your cash flow. That's really where we need some uh, better solutions. Um, certainly, um, there, are pro there are good things and bad things about this emerging gig economy. Um, you know, one of the positive things is that there are maybe more and easier choices for finding ways to earn some additional income um, on your time, on your own time and your own, maybe slightly your own terms. Um, I think uh, the gig economy can be challenging when that's your only source of income and the kinds of benefits uh, um, and steady paychecks that an employer in the past, a traditional employer will have provided, really aren't available. So I think there's a tremendous amount of work going on to, to think about what is the future of work and uh, uh, if the employer isn't going to provide the safety net isn't going to offer a retirement plan, isn't going to be the one with health insurance, et cetera, et cetera, and more of that, more of that risk is being shouldered by consumers, what additional systems do we need in place? Um, uh, so I think that's a really, important, um, a really important avenue because some of these models aren't going away. So the question is how can we evolve the system to make sure that the people who are driving you to the airport in Uber or, um, or are you know, running errands for you through TaskRabbit or um, um, have the support systems that they need. I think in the more far out ver uh, vision, there are some technologists who believe that as technology continues to advance, all kinds of jobs will just go away. There won't be the kind of work that we once knew. Um, and in that kind of world, um, which still feels a little sci-fi to many people, uh, maybe we need to consider something like a guaranteed basic income or universal basic income. Uh, and um, that idea, um, uh, while seen as quite radical by some, is actually getting some airtime now. Um, and there are some uh, uh, academics um, who are doing some interesting research into it. So I think the next few years, as we get a better handle on what technology means for the future of work, I think we'll promote a whole, um, provoke a whole range of additional questions. Hi, Bill Emmons from St. Louis Fed. Following up on Kelly's question, you know, one of the things we've talked about for years about uh, income is post-secondary education. And yet now we seem to be uh, finding that it's, it's a lot trickier than it looked in terms of paying for it. So how do you think about, kind of from a financial health or planning perspective, how do you think about that post-secondary decision and the debt that it sometimes takes, the quality of that education, the risks involved of not completing? I mean, that's, that's a tough set of issues. I agree. I, um... I won't pretend to have the answer to how we're going to fit this, figure out the student debt problem or how we're going to finance college um, for Americans. I think that's a very significant challenge and one we're going to have to deal with because, as you know, through your great research, um, being saddled with all that debt, among other things, is really um, causing younger people to stagnate and to um, get off to a much slower start in a range of other kinds of financial behaviors. Um, 
but it is so enormous that it's not just a matter of planning for it, right? Um, I do think that it calls into question um, the value. And I don't mean like don't go to college. Um, I mean being a better consumer, thinking a lot about what are you going to do coming out the other end, how much money do we think that's going to make, you're going to make doing that, and what does that mean about your ability to repay that loan, how long is it going to take you to recoup that money. So I think from, a, from the perspective of financial coaching and counseling around the educational decision, I think that kind of work is going to be more important than ever so that to the degree, in this moment where we haven't yet solved the expense problem, uh, folks are at least wide-eyed about uh, what they're getting themselves into um, and what's going to make sense for them. So I'm interested in the one-third of the financial diaries folks who earn under $60,000, but they're highly successful. What makes them successful, and is there a way that you can maybe bottle that or put it in a toolkit or something. And because, I mean, if you're, if you're a family of four and you're earning under sixty or $50,000, yet you feel financially healthy, you're doing something, I don't want to use the word right, but you're doing something that's helping you to succeed. It would seem to me that if we focus on those folks and how they're doing it and whether it's that they're, you know, they're not buying things or they're, you know, they're, they're going out, but they're, maybe their, their expectation level is a little low. They don't need to have a, you know, two-week Disney vacation when they could do a staycation that brings them a lot more joy as a family. So is there a way that we can highlight those folks and what they're doing to succeed that's giving them a, a, a measure of, of satisfaction mm -hmm. and maybe trying to, you know, push that out to the folks that are earning over $100,000 and aren't healthy? Yeah. So uh, the way I presented the data was confusing. Let me just clarify. The, the, the folks that you're referring to uh, in terms of how healthy they are, that's from our um, consumer financial health survey, unrelated to the 200 families we followed in diaries. But yes, if you segmented them, you'd find something similar. Um, you know, I wish I could give you the simple answer, right? They just did this. <laughs> and now everyone should do that. Uh, we certainly looked at factors that make you more likely to be um, successful in terms of planning and saving. Um, uh, but there are other things in life that we don't have control over, right? Like, who knew that the Johnsons, when they had the leaky roof, that their kid had asthma? And that was going to cause, you know, like, we have health conditions that aren't our, you know, in our control. We have a car accident that wasn't in our control or our planning. Um, things happen that we can't always plan for. Um, um, or even to the best of our planning, simply overwhelm that planning. Um, I also think that um, the nature of the kind of job you have and the way in which you get paid, the frequency with which you get paid, how volatile your pay is, absolutely has something to do with it. Right? We think that volatility is pretty widespread, uh, but there are some people who get a steady paycheck. Um, every couple of weeks, um, and it makes it much easier to plan and manage their cash flow. Um, another story from the diaries is a family, um, he repairs long haul trucks, <clears throat> and he does this on commission. And in the summer and winter months, he makes a lot more money. <clears throat> but in the fall and spring, he makes less because the weather conditions are such that it, it's not as hard on the tires and on the trucks. <clears throat> and they're constantly trying to figure out when to pay which bill because they don't exactly know how much money he's going to make that week. They have a sense based on the year earlier, but they don't exactly know. But if you look at his annual income, it's fine. And in fact, during the diaries um, study, he decided to take another job that was 45 minutes away that paid him less money on an hourly basis because he wanted the stability. He got a regular paycheck. He knew exactly how much it was going to be. It made their lives easier. When people view that trade-off as better, right, making less money, having to drive further to get to work, something is wrong. Um, and it's, it has nothing to do with his choices and decisions, really. Um, so I, that's the other thing I think I want to impart, is that all of us know that we should eat better shouldn't have that biscuit out there, right? Uh, but we do it anyway. Uh, we all know that we should drive the speed limit, but we don't always. We all know that we should not overspend, but 
sometimes we see those shoes and we just got to buy them. We all know, everybody knows, if there's one thing they know, everyone knows that we should, you should save money, whether that's through putting money away or spending less. But it is hard, and we don't always do what we know we should do. Um, and so, yes, are there some people in the world who overspend? Are the Johnsons maybe overspending a little bit? Maybe. Uh, but I do think we need to get away from this idea that if people would just behave better, um, that they would be financially healthier. In some cases, that may be true, but I think in most cases, it's just far more, people's lives are far more complicated than that. Um, so I wish I had the silver bullet answer for you, um, but I don't. We have time for one last question. Um, uh, hi, Jennifer. It's Julie from Omaha. How are you? Hi. Um, you know, we know that stress is the number one cause of health problems in America, and we know that finances are the number one cause of stress in America. Is there any way to engage the healthcare system in helping us with our work? Are you seeing that around the country? Are the public health people being, we, our public health people in Omaha were surprised by our outcomes when we did, worked with our single moms, and so they're like, what, what are you, you're doing the things we've tried to do with financial education, how is that happening? So are you seeing other examples around the country where that's happening? And I think working together will have much bigger impact. I completely agree, but really, you, don't give the microphone away. You should talk about what you've done. Well, really quickly, um, we work with single moms doing financial education and coaching in Omaha, Nebraska, and we found that the women started looking a lot better, and so um, I work at Crane University, so we got some, some faculty members to do some research on these women, and we did a baseline year one, year two, and we found that after two years from, after graduating from our program that we had... Um, that their income went up about seven grand over two years because they weren't stressed out of their minds. We found that their fast food intake decreased by monthly by one third. They started exercising 100 extra minutes a week. And then we also found that their waist circumference, which predicts strokes, heart attacks, and diabetes, went down 0.7 inches. So that's, it, but we need, but that was only 21 people. So we need a bigger study to show the impact it has. But I think there's some real opportunities for huge systems to to work together to address this problem. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, and I, I'm, I appreciate you sharing that because I do think that research is just so incredibly interesting despite the small sample size. Um, and we are seeing increasingly those communities come together, including here, right? There's a panel, um, I think, later today um, that's bringing those two topics together. Um, and increasingly, particularly out of San Francisco and the San Francisco Fed, there's been a lot of work to try to bring together the community development and public health uh, communities. Um, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation uh, and, and other similar foundations are recognizing that if they really want to improve health outcomes, they've got to look upstream and look at the broader social determinants of health, um, like some of the ones that you described. Uh, and so I do think that there's lots of opportunities there uh, to think about how you do that work on the ground. I know of one healthcare system that has a financial clinic alongside their health clinic, right? So when you're there, you're getting kind of a dual checkup, as an example. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're looking for more um, interesting models. I'll be curious um, to hear from all of you uh, about what you're doing here in Kansas City. With that, I think my time is up. Thank you very much.